comes with a wonderful background. He looks extremely young, but he has years and years of experience, both in impact as well as in innovation. Before I go on to him, I, I just want to say that um, for all of those who are new to this lunch talk, this lunch talk, IU lunch talks are open to everyone, not just GCF staff. So if you know, you know, if you know people who are interested in attending these, we we appreciate that and we encourage attendance from outside as well. All of these lunch talks are recorded and we've also put them on our website. So kindly try and use the microphone when you ask questions, which will inevitably happen. Um, we also encourage you to tweet. Our Twitter handle is at GCF underscore eval. And um, also use our hashtag. Our hashtag. Um, with that, I want to move on to uh, Dr. Hyun Shin. So, uh, like I said, um, Dr. Hyun Shin is an Associate Professor of Marketing and the Director of Social Innovation Lab, as well as uh, the Impact Business Research Center at Hanyang University in Seoul. He also serves as the editor of the Korean edition of the Stanford Social Innovation Review, also fondly called the SSIR. <coughs> In 2019, he founded the Impact Research Lab, which aims to measure impact and provide impact consulting. There's, um, other than these wonderful credentials, there's um, one other reason that we are particularly excited about Dr. Shin uh, coming to us. It is that the IEU itself now hosts two labs, right? One is the Data Lab, and one is the recently Christianed Behavior and Design Lab, or bad lab. <laughs> yeah, um, so we are really excited to have uh, Dr. Hyunshin today talking to us about uh, not just his work on, in Mongolia, but I'm hoping subsequently um, after his talk you'll also get a chance to talk to him about innovation, impact, and measurement and the work that he does at Hanyang, at Hanyang University. Uh, you'll also be glad to know that the IU has an official partnership with um, uh, with Hanyang now, and which essentially pr um, permits us to do a lot of hosted co-hosted events, and we are already planning a couple for the rest of the year. So, with that, over to you. Yes. <coughs> uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction, Dr. Puri, and uh, very nice meeting you. Thank you for coming. My name is Hyunshin. My name is Hyunshin from Hanyang University, and I'm very pleased to present my research on. RST-based impact measurement and evaluation project for G-Saver in Mongolia. Uh, as you may know, Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, is the coldest capital city in the world. And then uh, they have had a long, severe winter, nine months. And poor people usually live in a traditional tent care, and then they use coal extensively during the winter season, which causes a lot of problems. So uh, basically, the, because of the use of coal in the winter, the air pollution creates serious health problem by threatening children's lives, and also poor people spend more than 50% of their income to buy coals during the long winter season. In other words, economic problem. To address these problems, g a heat accumulator or heat absorber, has been introduced in 2010 uh, to address these problems, air pollution, energy poverty, by reducing coal consumption uh, by about 45% at least in the lab setting. And this appropriate technology-based product is reported to reduce coal consumption up to 45% uh, by providing a devious route to heat inside the stove and making it stay longer before going out through the chimney. And social enterprise, Good Sharing, has manufactured and distributed more than 70,000 units of g saver in Mongolia. And this RCT project aims to evaluate uh, is health, economic, and environmental impacts. Uh, indeed, uh, Mr. Mangap Kim, uh, who was the beating scholar in Mongolia, uh, he observed uh, uh, the social problems, and then he wanted to utilize his technology to address this issue. So he came up with this idea of G-Saber, and then when he came back to Korea, he presented his idea to here and uh, many institutions. And very famous uh, Korea-based international organization, Good Neighbors, became interested. So they decided to produce 
uh, about 100 units of g s a b e r in Korea, and they exported it to uh, Mongolia to see whether it works. And they, they realized that it worked. So they decided to found a social uh, enterprise, the first social enterprise in Mongolia, uh, good sharing, uh, and then they decided to uh, manufacture the g s a b e r products. In 2011, 11, about 4,500 units of g s a b e r Uh, was produced and was distributed to local people through the sponsorship of good neighbors. And interestingly, uh, Mongolian government became interested because some Korean people came and manufactured very weird thing, right? So they decided to pick uh, four or five units and see whether it what this is. And they did a lot of tests, and then they realized that this works. So uh, Mongolian government decided to buy 1,500 units of G-Saber, and. Indeed, this is kind of confirmation of the local needs. So Korean uh, agency, Koika, they decided to support this project. So in 2013, uh, Koika supported the production of 10,000 units of G-Saber, and they realized it worked. So in the next years, they decided to uh, support about 48,000 units of G-Saber. So uh, by 2017, about 70,000 units of G-Saber has been uh, distributed and installed. Uh, in Mongolia. And they wanted to see the impact. That's why uh, my university and Iwa Women's University uh, designed this RCT project. So from 2016, uh, June of 2016 through March 2018, we uh, performed the survey of 600 households in Ulaanbaatar, g e r a area. And the goal is to evaluate the effectiveness of the G-Saver project by measuring its health, economic, and environmental impacts. And we made very interdisciplinary kind of team, researchers from reputable universities. So to measure the health impact, we have uh, medical doctors from Harvard University and University of Pittsburgh, and also uh, public health professionals from Iwa Women's University. And to measure the economic impacts, uh, myself from Hanyang University and professor from Iwa Women's University, and also uh, professor of economics from Michigan State University. And for environment, environmental impact, uh, engineering professor from Iwa Women's University and University of Colorado joined us, and quality of life a professor from social welfare department joined this team. So in this way, we make a very interdisciplinary team to measure the impact from diverse angles, diverse aspects. So, <coughs> so we uh, performed our baseline survey in August 2016, and one big question is when should we measure the the impact. And we have two choices. One is during the very severe winter, let's say January, February, like minus 40 Celsius degree. So maybe the, we can see bigger impact, but the problem is after installation, it has shorter period. So we are not sure whether we can observe some impact. But uh, if we measure in, let's say, May 2017, then we have longer period to realize the impact. But in that case, May is mild winter. So the impact might be quite different. So what we decided is we just tried. Uh, we just decided to measure twice. So one in uh, February 2017 and the other in May 2017. And the next year we also did some ex post interview. And after baseline survey, we uh, led people to pick spoons. Some spoons have number one. Some spoons have number two, right? And then if you pick the uh, number one spoon, then we install the g s a b e r right away. And then if you pick the uh, spoon with number two. then we install the G-Saver after one year. So in that way, we can uh, compare the effectiveness of G-Saver in this randomization uh, kind of approach. So we observed some health impact uh, from, as you can see from the, this table. And uh, during the severe winter, the second survey was uh, in February. And then we observed this kind of expectoration and chest discomfort, uh, basically te uh, test group. has less uh, problems, statistically significant uh, effect was observed. And third survey in Mar uh, May, which is mild winter, uh, we observed that uh, dyspnea and headache, uh, people have less problems. And one interesting observation here is that if you look at the headache uh, data, during the severe winter, everyone has the problem. About 60% report that they have some headache, whether they are in test group or uh, control group. But in a uh, mild winter uh, season, basically test group with, uh, who are using G-Saver uh, report much less 
kind of headache problems. So in this way, we can separate the effect of cold weather and then the effectiveness of G-saber by measuring twice. So this was a uh, cool thing that we realized later. And um, yeah, this is the health impact. And also we observed the economic impact. So we uh, realized that uh, fire making frequency uh, test group, which used uh, G-saber, uh, basically made less uh, frequently the fire making. And fuel consumption and fuel expenditure, again, test group reported statistically significant kind of impact of uh, economic impact and coal consumption impact. So in this way, we, can, uh, we could uh, estimate uh, how much people can save uh, their income. And then uh, we realized that about 96,000 tugrik uh, annually can be saved uh, by using G-Saver. So we uh, tried to estimate the impact of 70,000 units of G-Saver by making some assumptions. And as you can see from this table, uh, we could uh, compute the economic impact, the increased disposable income of poor groups uh, up to 6.8 billion tugrik per year. And also, and also environmental impact, reduced consumption of coal uh, of 32,000 tons of coal annually, uh, which can be converted to the reduction of uh, CO2 reduction, 64,000 uh, tons. So based on this result, we uh, computed SROI, social return on investment. The first thing was economic social return. So decrease in coal consumption was 32,000 tons per year, and increase in disposable income was estimated to be 2.5 million US dollar per year. And environmental social return, decrease in CO2 emission was 64,000 tons per year, and then when we apply KAU20, uh, which was measured uh, January 2020, was 35,000 Korean won per ton. So we uh, use this number to estimate the value of CO2 reduction uh, to be 1.9 million US dollar per year. So annually, uh, G-Saber could produce economic social return of 2.5 million US dollar and environmental social return of 1.5 million dollar and adding up 4.4 million US dollar per year. And if we uh, consider the duration of uh, the duration of G-Saber, which is five years, then total social return can be estimated to be 22 million US dollar per year. And in the COICA, spent about 2.5 million US dollar for this project, and then and then the total social return on investment can be uh, estimated to be 7.8, about eight times or 78, 780 percent, which is pretty good. The summary of findings. The RCT shows the positive impact of G-Saber on the health of the respiratory system and the nervous system for the gated dwellers. And we also perform kind of questionnaire survey by using WHO uh, QL survey, quality of life survey indicators. And also we uh, confirm that the positive health impact of G-Saber uh, through this uh, survey. And the RCT project shows that G-Saber reduces coal consumption by 454 kilograms per year per household, uh, meaning that uh, the economic value uh, was about 2.5 million US dollar. And also the environmental value was 1.9 million US dollar, adding up 22 million US dollar, of million US dollar of social return for five years, and SROI about 7.8 or 780%. So these are hard numbers, hard facts. But I think more important part is the lessons we learned through this project. The first lessons we learned through this project was the difficulty in measuring the coal consumption uh, amount. So in the beginning, we tried to use prepackaged buckets. Uh, for example, uh, we thought about uh, giving like uh, a bucket, and in the bucket we can put like 10 packages, and each package have like 10 kilograms of coal. Then people can use one by one daily, and then maybe after seven days, we can call them and then uh, ask them how many uh, packages do you have in the bucket. In that way, we can systematically measure how much coal consumption uh, they uh, consumed. However, we realized that it's too costly to pack all the, all the stops. And then also, it doesn't fit with the lifestyle of the local people. So instead, we ask, make a question. We ask the consumers how much they use the coal per day based on their consumption during the last week or for the past seven days. But in the pilot study, we realized that people use very different units. So some people said, oh, I used 20 kilograms last week. 
And some people said, I used five buckets. Some people said, I used 10 shovels. It's crazy, right? <laughs> so basically, we messed up the pilot survey. So in the second survey, we uh, paid a lot of attention uh, to uh, this, how to make this key question to measure the uh, number accurately. And so we asked consumers how much in terms of kilogram they used the coal per day based on their consumption during the last week or for the past seven days. But, but the thing is, we try to make this very kind of familiar to the local people. So before asking this key question, we put many other questions, and then we intentionally ask the question uh, by using this concept, seven days or per week. So we try to train them uh, to think from like this kind of seven day period. And then after then, when they, are, when they become familiar, we ask this key question, how much coal consumption did you, uh, how much coal did you consume basically for the past seven days or for past week? And then in that way, we try to get the more accurate number of these key numbers. And another thing is discrepancy between lab and field. So in the lab setting, basically uh, we had kind of engineers and then they tried to uh, keep the temperature flat and then see how much uh, coal consumption can be reduced by g saber And then in the lab setting, they reported about 45% can be reduced. The coal consumption can be reduced. But we are not sure whether this will really happen in the real world, in the, in the field, right? And then what we discovered was basically consumers reduced their coal consumption by 1.8 kilogram per day during the severe winter, and again, 1.5 kilo kilogram per day during the mild winter. So if you just look at the uh, absolute amount, not much difference. But if you look at the relative uh, amount uh, during the cold, very severe winter, people reduced their coal consumption by 10%. But during the mild winter, they reduced the coal consumption by 20%. What does this mean? So uh, this implies that during the severe winter, coal reduction effect of this saver is limited. Because during the cold winter, people just put a lot of coals, right? And even though you can save the g saver and then keep the same uh, temperature, but they chose to stay warmer because it's cold outside. So the cold reduction effect was a bit limited during the severe winter, but in the mild winter, they, the g saver was more effective in reducing the coal consumption. But in, indeed, if you just look at the economic impact, the, how much you can save the money by using g saver or how much environmental impact we can observe during the severe winter, maybe it's limited, but we can also say that quality of life of these people can be improved by g -saver. Even though economic impact, environmental impact, limited, but we can observe more high quality of life, right? Because people would be happier, right? By using a lot of coals. So this is what we uh, realized that there is a discrepancy between lab and field. And another thing is gap between satisfaction and purchase intention links to pay. So through our survey, we observed that the general satisfaction of G-Saber was pretty high. It's like 4.6, 4.7 out of five points. And then when we asked, uh, the people said, about 90% of respondents said they are willing to recommend G-Saber to other people. So if you look at these kind of uh, numbers, then we can uh, say that they are very satisfied. However, when you ask them, you ask them, how much are you gonna spend to buy this product? The purchase intention was very limited. And the funny thing is, satisfaction, okay, satisfaction or willing to recommend is very subjective. But if you look at the hard number, basically people can save about $40 per year. And the five years of duration, they can save $200 by uh, having this G Saber device. $200. And then when you ask them, hey, are you gonna pay $20 to buy this product? People say no. Doesn't make sense, right? But w when I interview those people, indeed they have some different way of thinking. So uh, when you look at their, let's say their utility from future consumption or current saving, it's very low, basically compared with uh, maybe Korea or US or s something like that. So they have different kind of time discount factor. So the utility com computation might be quite different. So that's what we realized. So, Indeed, uh, that's uh, something very, that was very interesting uh, observation. And another, thing was, and another thing was timing issue, as you, I just uh, explained. So we had two choices. So should we measure during the severe winter? But 
shorter time period after installation, or should we measure longer uh, time window, but during the mild winter? So we didn't know, so we just decided to measure twice, and then budget increased, right? <laughs> so, but uh, still we measured, and then uh, later we realized that, oh, by measuring twice, we can see the t uh, trend, and also we can somehow uh, separate the effect of cold weather, and then also the effect of GSA or something like that. So it was pretty useful. So this was something we learned. And this is my last slide. So this project was very interesting because it is a kind of combination of development cooperation plus social entrepreneurship plus appropriate technology. And another thing is that I had all these nice hard numbers. But when I uh, present these hard numbers, people were not that excited, not impressed. And then I realized that when I add some stories, people became very interested. So this is more about impact communication. One interesting story is that there's a uh, lady, basically, and then she was uh, taking care of her flocks, like cows and goats and something, about 200 flocks. And in 2010, the winter, the weather was really severe, so her flocks were all dead, basically. So she moved to Ulaanbaatar, because at least if you live in nearby city, then you can uh, get some very low-paying jobs, like cleaning kind of stuff. And she uh, somehow she joined uh, this company, Kushering. And then when I interviewed her, she told me that when she came to the company, she was so scared to push the power button of the computer because she thought that it might explode if you put the, push the power button. So it was like that. But after two years, she made PowerPoint presentation. And then the next year, she became the kind of associate director of the factory. And then she went to local uh, place and then set up a kind of subsidiary uh, factory. And then after one year, she became the chief of the factory. Now she's the kind of number one or number two in the, in the company. So this is about, about empowerment, professional growth. And then what she told me was in the beginning, she couldn't do anything but cleaning. But later, she got all the education and training from the company. And then she learned how to fix the machine. And then later, she got the class of project management and English classes, etc., and leadership. And then later, she became kind of chief of the factory. And then now, she's taking care of her subordinate very well. And she, when she, I asked her uh, about her feeling, she said that I, she was very happy about working for social enterprise, which works for the good of the society, Mongolia society. And another very interesting story is that there's another uh, female employee. And she was, in the beginning, she was a clerk taking care of accounting and finance stuff. And she decided to study uh, the CPA exam, Certified uh, Public Accountant exam in Mongolia. So social enterprise, uh, good sharing, uh, decided to support her study by paying half of the tuition for pu uh, private academy. Because social enterprise is not about making the biggest money, right? It's not maximizing profit, but they try to maximize the potential of the people. So they uh, support this kind of uh, study. And then before the exam, she got two months of paid leave. Very nice, right? And so she passed the exam. And then she had a lot of choices. She could go to an accounting firm and really paid well. She had a very good opportunity, but she decided to stay. And then later she became marketing manager, human resource manager, or something like that. And now she's become one of the top two kind of personnel in the company. So the factory lady, uh, the chief of the factory, and then this person in the back office, they made many important decisions for the company. So this kind of empowerment story was pretty appealing. And then I realized that when I talk about this story, people became very excited. So uh, I realized that the uh, impact communication should be mixed way. So talking about some hard numbers and plus this kind of story, human story and the empowerment, how people grow uh, professionally. So this, is the last, this was the last uh, slide of my presentation. And indeed, uh, as you can see, we uh, used some traditional survey. Also, we bought this kind of machine to measure CO2 in the lung and then uh, and, uh, pulmonary function testing. And also, uh, we also bought some CO2 or SO2 kind of measuring devices. And then so we uh, tried to measure the impact from diverse angles. And that was a really good uh, learning opportunity. 
So thank you very much. And then if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Thank you, Dr. Shin. That was really fascinating. So I'm going to use uh, moderator's privilege to um, actually start off the discussion. Um, I, I really found your talk really interesting because um, not only did you talk about something that's very close to my heart, which is RCTs with mixed methods, um, but you also spoke about a few things that many, many impact evaluators and practitioners of RCTs do not talk about, which is failures in the field, right? And so uh, you spoke about the, difference, about the difference between the efficacy, so what you were seeing in the lab, which was a 45% reduction, uh, so the efficacy and the effectiveness in, on the ground, which was between 10 to 20%, depending on what season you were seeing. So you spoke about that. You spoke also about the importance of pilot testing, right? What you were seeing, what you were seeing in, the, in the lab was very different from, and even when you ran your survey questionnaires, right. there were very different responses. And then, of course, the difference between willingness to pay and intention. Right. Um, so uh, so these, are, these are things that impact evaluators don't talk about too much. And that's something that we definitely encourage people to, because uh, these are the things we want to learn from. Uh, so I have two questions. One, could you talk a little bit about sample sizes? Uh, because I'm, I'm a bit geeky. And um, I want to know what your adoption rates were. So, you know, with new technologies and given that we ourselves are talking about, thinking about behavior and behavioral science, um, adoption rates for new technologies, especially in extremely impoverished households where uh, capital markets are imperfect and you don't have symmetric information between lenders and borrowers, uh, one of the biggest challenges for adoption of technology is you just don't see um, uh, you don't see loans coming out, but also then impoverished households do not take on technologies that are expensive. So adoption rates amongst those targeted households and how you dealt with that. And then uh, the third question, and I promise I'll stop there, is uh, how people dealt with this idea of randomization, right? And whether they were happy with picking out spoons and saying, okay, well, we're only going to get it a year later, et cetera. Mm. Could you talk about that? Yes. Thank you. So the first question was? Uh, sample size. Oh, sample size. So, <laughs> so many questions. <laughs> so the first question, yes. So our sample size was 600. And then uh, basically we uh, provide this free device to every 600 households. Mm because we got the fund from the COICA. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of adoption rate, uh, it was kind of, uh, they voluntarily uh, agreed to mm -hmm. install their, uh, install this device in their home. And then uh, it was fully supported. And so what's the likelihood of scaling up? Um, mm -hmm. Given that that was completely subsidized 100%, mm -hmm. what's the likelihood that it will get scaled up and right. will be sustainable? So uh, in the first uh, batch of uh, 4,500 uh, units was fully sub uh, subsidized by G uh, Good Neighbors, NGO. And then 1,500 was fully subsidized by government, Mongolian government. And then later, the remaining 50,000 uh, 50, units is partially subsidized by COICA. So about one third of the money was paid by uh, local people. And the two thirds was paid by COICA. So in that way, 70,000 units were uh, distributed. And after that, we provide extra 600 units to people who didn't have the g saver And then it was fully subsidized because we have the measurement budget. And lay after then, indeed, uh, the amount of the households who doesn't have g saver was very limited. So they decided to pivot their business model. So now they are making environmental friendly kind of uh, pellet and also they are doing some other business stops. And then the funny, uh, very interesting thing is that this kind of pivoting was decided by local people mm. because local people realized that they already uh, distributed uh, 70,000 units of uh, g saver so the remaining market is very small. Mm. So they thought that if, if they keep making this mm. g saver then it does not be, it would not be profitable. Mm. So they tried to find another way to make this, their company more sustainable. But they said that they will come back 
maybe five years later when the duration is expiring. Yeah. And did you find that everyone was using the G-Saver five months later and ten months later? So, oh. so it's more about adoption behavior, right? Mm -hmm. um, indeed, uh, that was uh, one good thing. So in, I don't have a hard number about that, but uh, what do you realize that, uh, what I realized, oops, what I realized was uh, before G-Saver, there was a World Bank project, and then they, <laughs> uh, spend a lot of money to install Western style kind of uh, heating device in their home. But uh, some studies show that the adoption was not that great. Mm. So, because it doesn't fit with the local people's lifestyle. Mm. Uh, and if you look at the Western style kind of uh, heat stove, uh, it's kind of thin and tall mm. to maximize the efficiency, heating efficiency. But indeed, the local people use the uh, stove for cooking. Mm -hmm. And they have big family, right? So family, right? So they have low and kind of wide kind of stove to have a big pot. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't fit with the local people's lifestyle. And so what uh, I observed was when they have some problem with the uh, heating stove, uh, Western style, they just throw it away. So adoption rate might be quite low, I, I think. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the G-Saver, uh, as you can see from the picture. Yeah, this is the, the device. And basically, you can use your old kind of stove uh, and then the pipe. And between stove and pipe, you can put the G-Saver. So it's very small kind of modification. And then another interesting thing was that uh, in the first batch, uh, they make engineers basically make this uh, G saver, and the heating efficiency was pretty good. But when they go out and then talk to the customers, they realize that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. It's too heavy, basically. It's too heavy, and it's not easy to disassemble and assemble. So that means if you have some, some like choking, then it's not easy to clean up. Mm -hmm. so they just throw away. Mm -hmm. So. At that point, they worked with KAIST. And then, as you know, KAIST is a kind of MIT of South Korea. And engineering professors and students, they joined this project and they tried to improve the design so that it can be very light and then easy to assemble and disassemble. So after that point, they make the kind of version two mm -hmm. and people can easily clean up the stove. So from that point, I think adoption rate was pretty good. Mm -hmm. And another interesting thing was that when I went there, I talked to customers. And I talk about many things. And then one interesting uh, observation was that they care about design. Mm. They really care about design. So when, they, when I ask them, you know, do you like this new product? And they say, oh, design is pretty good. Mm. This is pretty. So when we think about the adoption rate, how to change the behavior, basically this kind of design or aesthetics kind of aspect is really important. Mm. And then indeed, we can learn a lot from marketing, I think. Because you know, marketing is about, I don't want to say this, but I'm a marketing professor. So. And marketing learns a lot from psychology. And psychology is about how, to people, how people make decisions and how can it affect their decisions. And in marketing setting, we try to deceive people, right? Hey, buy this, right? <laughs> but uh, indeed, this is pretty useful in development cooperation setting because we learn a lot how to change people's behavior, how to affect their choice. And then if you use marketing techniques uh, effectively, then I think we can increase the adoption rate and then make a real, really bigger impact. Wonderful. Questions? Thank you. Uh, so we'll take a few round of questions. Please introduce yourselves um, and give us a couple of minutes while um, Asha or even or Kotlin go around uh, with mics, please. <coughs> Hi, uh, this is Ali from DCP. Uh, thank you, Professor. It was quite interesting. My question is also related to the very last point, is entrepreneurship perspective, not in the evolution of one. So regarding the consumer behavior, like what you said, like when you told them that it's going to cost you, if you use coil, it's going to cost you $200, but you offer it $20, but they don't want to buy. 
Do you think, I mean, I understand the marketing perspective in that case, designing, attractive designing and other, but is there any other option like changing the behavior in terms of the uh, information providing them before? Like if you use this for this year, it could save you 180, or $180, or is there any other way? So it is not just only marketing or any other behavioral perspective is involved in this situation? Think a few questions. For sure. Yes. Thanks, Ali. Hi. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much. Uh, as a Mongolian myself, it's really nice to see a project that uh, aims towards uh, one of our definitely biggest pr uh, problems, air pollution in capital city. During winter, it's horrible there. <laughs> but um, yeah, so really, uh, it's a really great research, and thank you so much. And uh, one of my uh, questions was, um, for your health uh, impact measurement, how do you measure your health? Uh, for example, in from my perspective, it would be interesting to see how health is being affected by air pollution through different ages and gender, because there's a lot of like uh, children and pregnant women who might have way more impact too. And another question is, what's your future plan regarding this G saver? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And could you introduce yourself? Oh yeah, my name is Odgrel. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, again, thank you very much, Professor, for this presentation. Very, very interesting and insightful. And my question is very much related to the previous, uh, uh, to pre previous question. Um, knowing that we need to think about environmental and social impacts and benefits of projects, of development projects, and knowing that the GCF also looks at that very, or should at least look at that with, with more emphasis. Uh, my question is a little bit about these challenges. You were naming a lot of challenges in terms of design and in terms of uh, uh, measuring impact. And my question would be more towards towards this to say, okay, what are the challenges in looking into environmental and social benefits and how to how to really consistently measure these impacts? In, in particular, again, to the same to the same question on health, is there opportunities to maybe do that in real time? Is there any opportunities to do that more often to have a consistent messaging on on what are the benefits of of these projects? Thank you. So uh, let me answer to the first question, and then I totally agree that uh, maybe if we provide financial literacy kind of education together, maybe you can uh, get different results. But in uh, Mongolia, it was not easy, and especially we are targeting BOP kind of people, right? Very low income, low budget, limited budget. So. Really, I want to see whether financial literacy education can uh, change their uh, willingness to pay and purchase intentions. And I think that would be a very interesting uh, list topic for the future research. So maybe you can do that together. <laughs> and for the second question, the health impact. The health impact. Uh, basically, we use uh, that we work with doctors, medical doctors. Uh, some people are from the internal medicine. Uh, uh, doctor from Harvard University and long kind of prof, uh, doctor from Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh. And they have their own uh, kind of questionnaire set, which is kind of very well established. So we use the same uh, format to uh, ask questions to people. And also we try to measure using devices. But what we realized was this is kind of a uh, big challenge was when you are in, in home, you can get some benefit from G using G-Saver. But when you go out, you will be exposed to very severe air pollution, whether you are using G-Saver at your home or not, right? So this is kind of, uh, you cannot control this uh, indirect effect. So that's why it poses a lot of problems. And, problems. and then, indeed, uh, we could observe only a very limited uh, kind of health impact through this uh, G-Saver project. So, but, uh, Still, at least we find some uh, interesting uh, observations. But I think uh, that would be kind of future challenge, how to address these issues would be very important to measure the health impact. And for the third question, the real-time uh, observation, I think Dr. Puri is the expert. <laughs> She's the answer, I think. <laughs> 
Can I follow up on that question for health? Um, was your was your sample then powered to measure health impacts for the proportion of the population or the sample that would traditionally stay at home, say pregnant women mm. or children? Right. And could, were you powered in your sample uh, to to confidently test right. for that? So indeed, we intentionally limit our part, uh, participants to be female, mm. so because they spend more time in home. So that's how we address this issue. So all 600 participants were female. Oh, yes. Okay. So that's uh, in the design we uh, consider, but uh, in the end, basically, even though they are staying long time in home, but still they go out and then they are exposed to heavy kind of air pollution. Mm -hmm. So it was not easy to control. Uh, thanks for the presentation, and my name is Kibam Choi uh, in the Office of Portfolio Management. Uh, in terms of social return on investment, on that side, uh, I have a specific question on environmental Im impact. So, so total carbon abatement multiplied by spot price of KAU 20 uh, as of January 2020. But in my understanding, the KAU is all on credit. That means that it's more appropriate context in the, in the Korean industry per sector, per uh, boundary within Korea. So, Korea. so I think it's more appropriate to multiply it by Korea offset credit or some other multiplier because I think it's not all one's credit. So would you kindly clarify on this issue? Thanks. Thank you very much for raising this is important issue. And indeed, I'm, I have a limited knowledge on this matter. So I'm, I'm going to learn from you <laughs> after the talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you so much, thank Professor Shun. Um, I want to give you another round of applause. <laughs> but before we end, I also want to acknowledge uh, colleagues from the IU who um, month after month make this event possible. So Cortland, uh, please take a, a stand up and take a bow. <laughs> Even Asha. And, and overseen by Andreas. Um, so thank you very much. And I also do want to let all of you know that our next IU lunch talk will be in Geneva. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Where it'll be on the sidelines of the board meeting and it'll be on uh, environmental and social safeguards. Uh, so we've just brought out our new evaluation. And so we'll be doing a lunch talk um, on the sides of the board meeting. Uh, but our next lunch talk in uh, Songdo will be on the 16th of April. And our speaker will be our very own, uh, Anya Grobitschke. And um, she's the deputy head of adaptation. We're not here. She just left. Um, and yes, we look forward to having all of you with us. And thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.